Good afternoon to all our drone enthusiasts joining us for today's drone tech talk on underwater drones. My name is Silindi Lepepi Zungu, an associate for the Business Development Unit at the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone. Before we go any further, I'd like to start with a little bit of background. So the Drone Tech Innovation Showcase is a first event in a series of events brought to you by the Saldana Bay Innovation Campus, an initiative of the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone. These events include these drone tech talks, like the one you're attending today, an entrepreneur boot camp, and a game of drones pitching event, all leading up to our very first innovation day. So please follow the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone on LinkedIn for more information, or drop your details in the chat, and our team will be sure to add you to the mailing list. Before we go any further, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping points from our end, just to ensure we have a smooth session. So your mics will be muted for the duration of the session, as you have noted. Um, please send your questions through to the question and answer box when the question and answer segment of the session begins, or raise your hand to ask your questions to the speaker directly. The host will alter alternate between raised hands as well as the question and answer box. This will make for more interactive engagement. Before I take up any more of your time, I'd like to hand you over now to the capable hands of our industry expert, Mr. Grant Detroit, who is also the founder of Symbiotech for his talk on underwater drones. Hi, Grant, and welcome. Hi, thank you. I feel very welcome. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, my name is uh, Grant Detoy. I am uh, the founder of uh, Symbiotech. Um, we're currently in the process of developing uh, in-water drones. Ours is actually designed for both in and out of water operations. Our uh, main target area that we're particularly focusing on in terms of sectors is the maritime oil and gas renewable energy port and maritime uh, sectors. Uh, my background in particular has been around uh, in-water drones or as we commonly call them remotely operated vehicles and uh, I've been operating these for the past 15 years in uh, the different sectors that I've, I've mentioned earlier that, that we're focusing on as a business as well. So uh, yeah, without fail, what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a, a history in terms of the whole lot and a bit of a de definition. So uh, one of the first things that anyone thinks of when you speak to them about a drone is something that has one or more sets of blades and flies. So like a quadcopter or a little helicopter or some sort like that. Uh, by loose definition, uh, it, it actually opens up the whole thing in terms of what is a drone. Um, and this is where the in-water component starts becoming a possibility. So uh, one of the most common forms of in-water drone or underwater drones is what we call a remotely operated vehicle. And these have been in use for quite some time. Uh, some of the first aerial drones that were used, <laughs> driven by the defense sector, uh, like most things in, in terms of big industry, a lot of it is actually driven by defense sectors throughout the world. So uh, the, the first uh, unmanned aerial vehicle was uh, recorded back in 1930, uh, used in war times. So if you include further other, other devices in, in terms of underwater um, vehicles, then you start looking at a whole broad array. There's a big classification system under which these things fall in, uh, under. Uh, they cover ROVs, AUVs, um, plows, trenches, and a myriad of different things. Um, ours that we focus on, as you can see behind me, is a magnetic crawler. And this, again, is a little bit more specific to meeting a particular um, demand or an application as such. So these uh, underwater drones have been in use, as I said, for, for quite some time, myself using them for about 15 years now. Um, and they have a lot of different applications. Um, in terms of geography, ge geography, the applications aren't really much different. Um, 
if you say South Africa versus, uh, say, the EU or the US or any other sectors or regions, um, the one of the main differences that has just been, if you look at South Africa versus kind of the rest of the world, is how it's been adopted. So I've already mentioned the fact that the defense sector is, is a big driver behind this for whatever uses that they may see fit. And if you go into the private sector, um, there's a few sectors that have really driven the development of, of these devices. So um, oil and gas has probably been one of the bigger ones, at least for me in particular, in my experience, it certainly has been. And they've use these things in, in anything from just a basic visual application. In other words, let's do a inspection of a structure. Uh, then just using simple technologies like uh, cameras, uh, ranging right through to going with rather complex uh, sensors, which can provide a visual component as well. Um, in this case, you know, you're referring to stuff like ultrasonic thicknessing to be able to determine the plate thickness of a hull or some kind of structural application. So that's the oil and gas sector. Maritime is uh, very much uh, also using this kind of thing. Um, I focus a lot on what we call ULs or underwater inspections in lieu of dry docking. Um, for those of you maybe not familiar with it, these are basically intermittent inspections that are required by classification societies. And these societies have periods during which these vessels or structures need to be inspected. And depending on what is needed, well, you'll have different solutions that will go out there, different kind of drone solution as such. Um, the other applications that they'd be used for is uh, in-water inspections. And these are normally just kind of spot inspections, which uh, could be anything from maybe someone ran aground and they think they need to just have a look. or well, not think, normally they have to have a look <laughs> and uh, just verify what the condition of the structure is. Um, in-water surveys is another one. And this particularly pertains to the sale of a vessel often. Uh, they will ask for an in-water survey. Now, um, one of the main reasons that you would do these, these three types of surveys that I just mentioned right now is primarily because of the cost of dry docking. So if you are going to take a vessel out of water, obviously you're taking that vessel out of service. And there is obviously a large cost component to it. Um, dry docks, at least in South Africa, range from if you cheap and don't have a big vessel around 10,000 rand per day um, upward of 100,000 rand and then you're not including all the third party uh, people that you need to bring in for scaffolding and, and everything so it, it takes quite a bit of time quite a bit of planning quite a bit of scheduling because there are only limited amounts of uh, dry dock facilities or synchro lifts or any means to basically get a vessel out of the water in order to do these, these activities. So if you can do work in water, uh, you certainly have the potential to save yourself time and save money. And this is amongst the different applications that, that can be done. Uh, two other areas in particular that uh, are becoming on the rise at the moment, depending on where you are in the world, but it's focuses around vessel and port security. So with the vessel and port security, your, your big concern here is um, anything ranging from a kind of a militant component. In other words, there have been reported incidences where limpet mines have been adhered to vessels. Um, and these can be triggered remotely or, or under certain circumstances. So depending on where you are in the, in the world or going to, sometimes they want to inspect the hull to make sure that there is no uh, issues around that. Contraband is another big component, a uh, large amount of smuggling that is done, whether it is just illicit uh, products like uh, cigarettes, for example, that have been more brought in, right through to um, 
drug smuggling, which is obviously a big component in certain parts of the world. And these guys, they're constantly getting cleverer and cleverer as to where they hide these things and how they're getting in the men, even using their own submarines nowadays. So these, these are just some of the visual and sensor based type applications that uh, can be used or are used pretty much anywhere in the world, really. Um, intervention is uh, becoming more and more a big purpose for, for these different kinds of drones. So one of the main things that drive intervention with regards to drones is a big component that focuses around risk removal. So normally what we first type of thing we do when we work with risk is we would like to try and remove it completely if possible. Now, obviously this isn't always viable because if you remove a risk entirely, um, your, your most common way of removing it in this case would be to say to, to remove a diver. Um, but obviously you need to do the work. You need to still be able to achieve the task. So the next thing that we would normally do is how can we make the environment safe for a diver to be able to go in and do that work? So we'll set weather parameters and a series of different conditions, which would include depth um, as to whether they can or can't operate. You might say that they can only do daytime operations or nighttime operations. So you can see how this also imposes further restrictions in terms of timelines to be able to get a task done or an application done, an intervention done. And this is obviously now costing money because there's downtime, um, standby costs and, and all sorts of other things. So the next step is to use an alternative means. So what you want to be able to do now is to to bring in another device that can hopefully execute the, the task. And this is where, in this case, drones becomes a big component around what can and can't be done in terms of um, an application that's needed. So um, in my experience, the applications that we've done quite a lot of with, whether it's, for example, with uh, a drone like ours behind me or with ROVs for other companies that I assist. Um, they are, for example, like uh, overboard discharge isolations. So if a company needs to have a look at a valve or a spool piece that is on the inboard side of a vessel, um, they would need to blank off the outside. So obviously to prevent water from flowing in when they remove the spool or, or the, the valve. So this is the kind of thing that, that could be done. Uh, fracture, blanking. So there was recently a, um, an incident of a vessel that uh, ran aground. Uh, fortunately, it was able to come free on its, on its own steam, but uh, they had managed to get a fracture in the hull. And this was obviously letting in a fairly large amount of water and a little bit more than what built pumps were designed to be able to handle. So they had two options. Uh, the one was to ship out a team of, of divers who would then basically try and remedy the, the solution. Or the other one, which was to send out a, uh, a drone and basically blank off. So in this case, they, they went with the drone. Um, the main reason they went with the drone was because it was simply quicker. Uh, to be able to get there. And it was also cheaper um, to be able to, to carry out less equipment, less staff, less people required. So fracture blanking or any kind of blanking, sea chest blanking and stuff like that is, is another uh, application. Uh, coffer dam installations and removals. So uh, I've, I've been a part of uh, teams where we had to remove sites or parts of the side shell on, on, a, on a hull, which is quite a tricky thing because obviously it's, well, in this case, it, most of the, the fractures were underwater and you're going to cut into the hull and you're going to potentially flood the vessel, sink it. Um, so 
the company that I was working with at the time came up with a very uh, innovative solution whereby they had coffer dams that were lowered in place and assisted in this case with an ROV. And then the side shell was able to actually be cut out and, and new pieces securely put in place. And then later on after testing, they could remove the coffer dams. Other things that's coming up more and more so nowadays is uh, focusing around hull cleaning. So hull cleaning is becoming a very big thing. Um, the big drive behind it is around food security and also around cost for operator. So invasive species is, is, is becoming a, a very big problem, uh, whether you're in the sea or on land, it's, it's becoming a more and more so an, an issue. And organizations such as the International Maritime Organization I started setting us out guidelines along with companies like BIMCO and Glow Filing um, to basically try and reduce and preferably even stop the transferal of invasive species into areas that have a risk of being damaged because of no competitor for these organisms that would settle. So they become quite, quite rife. I've worked on a couple of jobs myself where we've seen this taking place on vessels and it adds a substantial amount of weight onto the vessels. Uh, in this case, the vessel I'm referring to was an FPSO that was stationary. So lots of easy times for, the, for these species to settle. Creates a lot of problems, even in terms of structural integrity. Uh, when you clean it off, they often take the, the coating off the vessel and this becomes a, a big issue as well. So hull cleaning, especially with the focus of being able to retrieve uh, the biomass that you will clean off, uh, filter it out and, and return a, a clean water back into the port um, is, is becoming a, a very, very big component around that. Um, and then the efficiency side is another thing. So um, something that, that we've been focusing on is creating tooling sets that will be going onto our drones. And basically what we do is um, we, we clean the hull, we extract, and we pass off the benefit, not so much that we do, but the, the operator is passed off the benefit of a clean hull. And this makes it more streamlined. And that means that you will be burning less fuel to sustain a certain amount of speed. So one of the main things, especially for your in the maritime sectors with regards to your cargo vessels and other um, oil tankers and the like, they would like to try and get from one place to another place on a, on a constant speed as far as possible that helps them to maintain schedules and, and other things like that. So they, they want to be able to do this. They need to be able to do it. It, it helps them. which is a very common figure roughly uh, on a saving for a trip. You could save quite a bit of money for, for, for yourself or whoever the operator would, would be. So one of the other things that's also really uh, come into play around drones, um, especially underwater drones in particular, is to do with sensors. So. Aerial drones have had a lot of advantage in, in the past. The environment in which they operate typically has a very good line of sight. So most sensors or many sensors literally use a line of sight of visual. So if you think of an aerial drone, it uh, uses cameras and it will use different sensors such as DVLs or uh, maybe not DVLs, but um, laser, for example. And, and these are all... Um, visual based thing, uh, sensors and, and they rely on a, on a line of sight. When you bring those sensors into water, you have a different viscosity. So the water is a lot more dense and any particulate that goes in tends to linger. It, it doesn't just fall down like, like sand or dust would fall out of, the, out of the air. So it's made a lot of challenges around uh, sensor use with regards to in water um, or underwater drones. Slowly but surely this has started changing and over the years we've managed to see a lot of benefits 
around these sensor developments, especially with regards to size. Um, if I think back about uh, a Doppler velocity logger, for example, 15 years ago, um, you would be looking at something that weighed 30 kilograms or so, it was fairly large. And right now, um, they, they're coming out in, in, a, in a reasonably small, very compact size. And that even comes with um, AI capability built into it, along with the various other sensors that before you had to add in um, individually. So these things are all coming along. Um, acoustic sensors, so your little sonars have also become more compact, which has allowed that to be put onto different uh, devices as well. Photogrammetry is something that's come along in great strides, uh, whether it's mono-based systems or stereo cameras. Um, the, the ability to do stuff with all of these is, is quite, quite phenomenal. Um, the ability to to scale, to measure, to to get to build mesh uh, images out of these things has, has certainly come a long way because of the sensors that are starting to to enable us. Laser is another one. Um, so lidar in particular isn't so much one that we use underwater for for various reasons, but uh, there are other forms of laser scanning that that can be used under certain conditions. So I think those are just some of the um, the sensors that you know, that have really come into play and, and started bringing the industry and what we can do uh, certainly in, into a, a, much, a much better space and gives us the ability to service people better. So before I conclude, just very briefly, future of uh, drones. Well, the great thing is because of all these sensors and things I've mentioned before, it's allowing us to start coming into the similar place and use that aerial drones have been able to do. And there's a lot of new technologies that have been enabled through this and, and additional things. So I think it's going to be uh, a good a good place to be uh, in for the for the foreseeable future. And I think it could have a, a great amount of applications still further to come. Um, yeah, thank you very much again, uh, before I overstep my time, yeah, much more, <laughs> uh, hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Grant. Um, that was such an informative um, session. Um, we don't have a lot of questions in the question and answer box, so we'd like to encourage the attendees just to share their questions or else they could raise their hand and we will take your questions as and when they come. Um, but that also might mean that your, your, your presentation was so detailed and you left no stone unturned. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, maybe just to address the one question that we do have from Anonymous, it's uh, Anonymous is asking, how is underwater drone adoption in South Africa? It's a two part question. And then he goes on to say, also as Symbiotech, do you focus mostly on local markets or outside of South Africa? Okay, um, underwater drone adoption in South Africa. South Africa has been one of the countries that has been a little bit slow on the uptake of these, these types of uh, drones. Um, that said, there are companies that actually do operate various underwater drones in South Africa. Um, most of them are obviously around the Cape Town area. It certainly seems to be one of the main, main hubs. But you will find them along the coast in most significant ports. It certainly could be done a little bit faster in terms of the adoption. There is a little bit of a, call it a mindset of we've always done it like this. And the always done it like this has been focused around the use of divers. So that's pretty much been been how it works in that regard. Slowly but surely, I think the technological component will, will break through more. Um, at this stage, Symbitech, I wouldn't really say that we have a particular focus as such. We've had a lot of interest in South Africa for um, working with us. Um, we've also had interest abroad. Uh, the, the foreign component certainly does seem to be more promising because, as I mentioned earlier, the, the uptake uh, abroad is definitely more so than in South Africa, but the benefits to both regions would be pretty much the same.
Awesome. Okay, so it seems we've got quite a few questions that have recently come in. Um, the first one from Alexander Kale, uh, and he asks, what are some of the biggest barriers to underwater drone technology? Sensors is probably one of the, the big barriers. They are very costly because most of them are made abroad. Um, uh, so it's obviously you've got forex costs, you've got shipping costs, you've got duties and, and the like, which has definitely um, made, made it a little uh, slower on, on the uptake in, in that component. I just want to see if I can get back to that question. It seems to have gone off the screen here. Um, is this? Uh, you've moved yeah, it to us. No. Okay, cool. Um, then there's another question from Wayne. Um, and this is, do we have some guidance for people wanting to start a career in drones? And what sort of qualifications are required? Um, definitely happy for you to, uh, to touch on that grant, but maybe just to give a little bit of insight to, Jane, to Wayne, uh, we will be covering that topic specifically on the session we're hosting this Thursday. So same time, um, and I believe you should have the, the link and the, the information for that. So go ahead, Grant, please, can you? All right, yeah, when, um, look, it, it's a very diverse area. Uh, I mean, we, we work with uh, design engineers, electronical engineers, uh, software developers. There, there is many different facets. So if it's something that you would like to get involved in, my suggestion is find out what part of it you are most interested in um, and start from, from there. The other option that you have would be to reach out to a company such as us or one of the other operators and um, get see if they have any posts available or maybe even just do some some voluntary time uh, see see where you feel you could fit in and and, and go for it from there it's probably one of the, the best ways the innovation campus is something uh, i believe coming up now with options that will give you more details as well so i'd, I'd I'd stick around and, and follow that. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for that, Grant. Um, the next question, again, from Anonymous. Um, he asks, do you have any advice for anyone wanting to start a business in drones and or a business in manufacturing technology? Um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and just respond to this, Grant, but happy for you to also add. Um, so we do have a session scheduled for the 9th of September, the Entrepreneur Bootcamp. Um, details will be shared on the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone LinkedIn page. Um, so should you be interested in attending that, that would be a great, um, a great way to get the answers you require. But Grant, please do um, assist Anonymous on his question as well. Okay, so uh, wanting to start a business in drones. Um, sure. It's, it's been a long walk for us to get to where we've been going. Um, we started off our first conceptuals in 2017. Um, so yeah, it's not, a, it's not an easy route. Uh, I think you, you've got a couple of different options. I mean, you can go the route of building something specific to what you would like to do, which is what we did. So we believe that our solution has certain advantages over a free flying device. Um, other people will simply rather just go and buy a free-flying device and provide a, a service. So those are definitely two things that you want to keep in mind because it's certainly different routes to market. Um, one, the one will take, will take longer, but uh, the other one has other advantages. So I think if you have anything that you want to get more specific into, I'll drop my email later on and you're welcome to get more involved in the nitty gritty. I, I think this is something that can take quite a bit of time to discuss, but I'm open to discussing it. Thank you so much for that grant. Uh, next question from Munub, sorry, Munib Badarun. Um, are there any licensing and authorizations involved in underwater droning? Um, I'm assuming that this is the uh, licensing comparative versus say an aerial drone. So with, with aerial drones, you have to have a license to operate them commercially. Um, within water, no, there is um, no real requirements. There's no real air traffic control or anything like that. 
um, you're just going to be operating within a, a small defined area. So there, there's no real licensing. Uh, however, for example, what we do is we, uh, we lease or license out our devices, or it's what we will be doing. Um, but I guess these are two different forms of, of leasing or licensing. So again, if, if you have any questions around those, feel free to drop me more uh, an email letter. Um, perhaps Manip could also be unmuted uh, should he want to maybe elaborate on his question a little bit further. But in the interim, I'll just go to the next question from Gerard Klute. And he asked, does underwater drones also require an aviation? Okay, so you just essentially answered that question. And where, <laughs> and where would your company fit in? I'm not sure if you want to touch on that. Um, well, if it's if it's aerial drone versus uh, water underwater drone, then look, the, there is no real um, they, they they're treated very differently from each from each other. Um, I would say, in terms of where we fit in, in terms of drones in the underwater space, the closest kind of equivalent would be what we refer to as ROVs or remotely operated vehicles. Um, we are able to do a lot of similar kind of stuff to what an ROV does. It's just that we've managed to develop a system that has a number of advantages over a lot of ROVs um, based on the area. In other words, the, the area in, in the water column that, that we work in. So it's inherently unstable. So um, we found a way of stabilizing things. Okay, um, so the next question comes from an anonymous. Um, do you have cost comparative case studies showing advantages of using drones, IPO divers, and intermediate class surveys? No, not, not personally. I'm sure you could probably find them online. Uh, what I can tell you, for example, is I, um, I did a, a UWILD uh, a while back. Um, in the case of this particular instance, divers were used on, on one occasion, and the project took just shy of, uh, well, just a little over a year. Uh, we went in and provided the same service using remotely operated vehicles. It took us five weeks. So if you work out the, the day rate that is charged and all the equipment that is needed, diver versus ROV, five weeks versus a little over a year, um, I'm sure that would be quite obvious that there'd be a cost benefit. Yeah, okay. Thanks again for that, Grant. Um, so Anonymous asks, what is the power source of underwater drones? Right. Uh, typically, they use uh, what we call a tether to link the, the drone or the robot to the top side. Um, so yeah, the tether cable via a power supply on the, on the top end, but there is a very big growth coming up in completely autonomous uh, devices that are going under and they're what we call residential devices. So they actually reside and live, they'll be installed close by to where they will work uh, and they are mission based. So they will be given a specific task to go and do, they will go and do the task and they will come back home as such. Like uh, a dr aerial drone has a, a home or a point of origin where it starts. And inside this area, there will be a, a built-in charger which will allow the batteries to be charged. So it's depending on exactly what kind of device you're looking at using as to where your power source would be coming from. Awesome. I think you touched a little bit on this, but the next question again from Anonymous is how can underwater drones help with marine conservation? They certainly can help a lot. Um, so in the case of something well worth having a look at, uh, have a look for Google Blue Robotics. It's a uh, American camp, or actually a university that, that started this off as a um, open source project, it still is open source. You can either buy the stuff from them directly or you can take whatever they provide you and, and make it. Um, but one of the particularly great things with this company is they've, they've made everything to be very modular and a lot of people have taken it and adapted it for a lot of nature and marine based uh, projects, which has certainly uh, been very useful. I, I know one of the projects they, they set up because they had uh, there's been a big uh, like infestation of, of, I think they're called lionfish. 
and they're particularly difficult to handle. They're very poisonous. Um, so they used these little in-water drones, or underwater drones, to basically go and capture them and, and retrieve them. I don't know how successful the project was, but I, my understanding was that they had managed to capture quite a few of these. So yes, that's just one example out of many. That's really, really wonderful to hear. Um, next question from Graham Walker. Um, he asks, how does the market look for global commercial and military underwater vehicle suppliers in terms of opportunities in Africa? Sure. Um, the African component is quite difficult. We've really struggled ourselves to find market access in, in, the, Southern, in the African market. Um, very similar to South Africa is that the uptake has just been very slow. People are not familiar with the technology and they go rather with an option that they understand best, which is often, as I said before, it, it focuses around divers. So I certainly believe there would be a lot of um, uptake. I mean, the, the benefits that Europe and the US and the UK and Scandinavia and all these other areas that have adopted these so well um, would, would apply to, to anywhere else. So I think if, if you can get inroads into these, into these areas, um, I mean, we, we've started making some now on, on East Africa and this definitely would, would open it up. There's, there's a big drive with, uh, companies like organizations like the International Maritime Organization that is motivating uh, having similar standards because, for example, vessels have to go from Africa into Europe. And if our re regulations and standards are different, then it makes trade different, difficult. So they're trying to work with their partners in different parts of the world. And in this case, it, it includes Africa. So there are drivers behind it. Thank you so much, Grant. Um, so in preparation for today's session, I did a little bit of reading up myself and I was very interested to find out that this kind of technology has been in existence since the 1950s. And I think you mentioned 1930s. So um, there's obviously been a lot of advancement in the technology. Um, so this is leading up to the next question by Anonymous, who's asking, where do you see underwater drone tech in the next five to 10 years? Again, this is gonna be field specific or application specific, but uh, one of the main things, is, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, is, is sensors. And um, in, in our case, we've played a lot with machine learning, machine vision, stereo um, visuals and photogrammetry. So when you start putting all of these different pieces of technology and software and all sorts together, then you can start doing a lot. Um, something that I, I didn't mention, but with AUVs in particular, swarm technology has become quite a lot. And with aerial drones, swarm technology is also becoming quite large. So in the arena of hull cleaning, for example, um, you know, you're getting tankers that are coming in. They're almost 400 meters long in some of the bigger cases. And to clean a surface like that, if you work out what the surface area is, it actually takes quite a while. These activities are being done normally when the vessel is in port. So you have the amount of time to clean that vessel or work on that vessel between when it is tied up and when it costs off again. So sometimes a singular device might not be your solution or alternatively the vessel sails off with an incomplete job. Um, so you, 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 you can start using swarm technology as well. So there's a lot, uh, as I said, it is industry specific and it's going to focus around what exactly you want to be doing. But five to 10 years from now, uh, I would love to see multiple um, drones of, of ours being put onto a vessel at, at one time, each entirely autonomous, specific tooling, specific activity, going in and getting it done quick as possible. Okay, thank you again, Grant. Uh, Manib has a follow-up question. He asks, are there any companies or are there many companies like yours coming up in South Africa? No, there are not. Um, there are certainly a couple of ROV companies in, in South Africa. 
Um, all of them have pretty much bought their own equipment. In other words, they've sourced it from, from abroad and they are um, either leasing it out or they will provide the service for you depending on what the activity is that would need to be done. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what, what we're actually doing, um, my knowledge is we are the only operator in South Africa. Okay. Um, the next question is asking, do you have any, does South Africa have any competitive advantage for drone manufacturing? You know what? I'm going to actually say I, I really do believe that there is. You know, in, in the past, everyone has been, um, you need to ship out your manufacturing. And with exception to software development, um, everything else I have managed to do cheaper in South Africa than abroad. Um, obviously, at this stage, we're small scale in terms of the volume. So maybe things yeah. will change for us a little bit later when we start producing much larger volumes of these devices. Um, but there's a lot of things that you need to consider, like quality, for example, of, of the build. Uh, there are certain parts of the world that are very well known for high quality builds and, and others not so much so. And this is, I guess, a bit of a, a compromise that you make in terms of the quality of your build. Um, that, that you do. So we've, we've diversified in terms of where we source our materials, but in the end of the day, um, I mean, like the device you see behind me, this was uh, almost all sourced in South Africa in terms of raw materials. It was all machined, milled, fabricated in, in South Africa. The only outside components has been on the development side of it. Interesting. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Um, last question from Anib. Is your design in-house or is it mostly in-house? Yeah, the design is all entirely in-house. Um, everything in it is, is, is in-house. Uh, a lot of the, the types of components and stuff which we use are still coming off the shelf or we take them off the shelf and we modify them according to what we need. Okay, and the last question comes from Graham Walker, um, who asks, with some similarities regarding aerial drones, how is water space management applied? And how do you alert other potential underwater vehicles users? And do they have their own obstacle avoidance or other ROVs? Um, yeah, normally what we would do is, if you're going to be working with multiple devices in one space, um, you normally set your goal or your project up with everyone being on the same team. Um, it's very rare that you will have multiple companies doing simultaneous operations. And even when you do, you normally are required to, to work together. There are procedures and standards that are required. Um, in terms of obstacle avoidance, yes, there certainly is. Um, most of it is acoustic based. So you're looking at uh, sonars, um, or as we call them, pingers as well, um, that, that you'd be able to use to detect. But probably one of your main things is just making sure that you, you define your, your scope of work very clearly amongst everybody. And it's not randomly people just moving around. I think something that will happen in the future is as more and more operators come along and we're all hypothetically working at Key 5 at Cape Town Harbor or later on um, at the Sildana Bay Newport, um, you may have different operators each working on a separate activity, which would not really require them to kind of work together. And then I'd imagine you'd almost need to start adopting a kind of an air traffic control type of thing excuse me, just to make sure you don't get entangled. Otherwise, it could become messy. Okay. Um, as I said, that was the last set of questions. Uh, thank you once again, Grant. That was an incredibly informative and enlightening um, session. I think we all, 
all are so much wiser now and know so much more about underwater drones because of it. Um, I think you have shared your details in the chat box. So if anyone is maybe looking to get in touch with you, has any more questions, they're able to do so. Um, maybe just to check with regards to your presentation, will you be sharing that at all? Um, well, I don't really have a presentation. I just got the notes, but I'm I'm happy to share those um, to you guys, and then you can pass pass them out. Um, okay. I haven't actually made my details available in terms of email address and website. Okay. Maybe see if I can. Do you want to put it out in the chat box? Um, I'm not actually able to add a chat okay. in. I think what we will do is just share that information on our um, on our innovation campus uh, uh, LinkedIn page, and that way everyone will know how to get a hold of you. Thank you so much again, Grant. Um, no do worries. appreciate uh, your time, and thank you for everyone in attendance and for your participation in the session. We definitely look forward to you joining us for tomorrow's session on integrated four IR technologies into school. Um, and again, we've really benefited from this informative session, and we're really, really, really excited um, to learn more. Um, and I uh, hope you have a good day further. Thank you, everyone.